Yes, I am. Wait, just one second. Wait. Okay. Uh, so our next speaker is Lan Nguyen, who speaks on uh, by Lipschitz equivalences and quasi isometries of arithmetic metric spaces. So please. Okay, first let me uh, thanks the organizer for the invitation to present my work. So my talk today will be on a series of open problems and my recent solution for, for them. So um, let me, and the, the problem consists, uh, concern the, uh, the existence of by Lipschitz equivalences and quasi isometry of arithmetic metric spaces initiated by Richard Short and later generalized by uh, Nathanson. So uh, let's start with uh, some basic uh, information that give the contact to these problems. So one of the objective, uh, central objective of geometric group theory is to understand the connections between algebraic structures of groups and large scale geometry of these groups viewed as uh, geometric uh, objects, typically as Cayley graphs uh, with, a, with a metric structure on it induced by the set of generator, by the word metric from the generator. So there's, there's an important research program in this area called the Gromov's program, where they study the classification of finally generated groups uh, via their large scale geometric structures, uh, namely the classification of their of groups as metric spaces up to quasi isometries. So problem concerning uh, by Lipschitz equivalences and quasi isometries of Cayley graphs, particularly those involving growth for group with infinite generating sets remain wide open in geometric group theory and lead to important problems in additive combinatorial number theory. Uh, in brief geometric terms, a by Lipschitz equivalence between metric spaces is a bijective map, where distance is distorted by a uniform factor. And a quasi-isometry between metric spaces is a by Lipschitz equivalence between some R nets of these spaces. Uh, in other words, distance is being distorted by a uniform factor uh, above a given scale. Quasi isometry capture the large scale geometry. So basically, that large scale geometry, the geometry is there from afar, like from standing at infinity, but ignoring local geometry of these spaces, sometimes possible to recover some or all of the algebraic structure of a group from its quasi isometric properties, such as a, a such a phenomenon referred to as quasi isometric rigidity by Richard Short, uh, who has studied the problem of classifying algebraically all groups that are quasi isometric to a given group or a metric space. So, um, so here, uh, generating set, uh, I think here my slides a bit. Uh, okay, so uh, in number theory, basically there are uh, problems that, uh, 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 problem that, that uh, concern generating sets that are infinite, even though the group can, can be finally generated. And that's irrelevant for number theory. For example, the kind of problem where the integer under addition, the group integer under addition with various infinite generating set of integer. So in this presentation, I will discuss uh, our result, which uh, solves several open problems at the, in the interface of number theory and geometric group theory concerning the additive group uh, Z with various infinite generating set of integer. The principal question concerning these problems center on the existence of quasi isometry and by Lipschitz equivalences between uh, these spaces, D is Z, D sub A and Z, D sub B, arising from uh, this group under uh, these word metrics induced by these generating set of integers. So these problem first uh, posed by Richard E. Shorts, which arrived from his work concerning Gromov's program in the mid-1990 mid and later generalized by uh, Nathanson around 2008. So let's start with some basic background. Um, so let M and N be two metric space with, uh, with metrics M and N. And uh, so two metric space M and N are said to be by Lipschitz equivalent with respect to some number L if there exists a bijective map F from M to N, satisfying this double inequality. And such a map is say called a global by Lipschitz equivalent from M to N. So if F satisfies this equation zero one, then F is, uh, is the homomorphism from M to N with respect to these, these metrics. And if F satisfies uh, zero one, this equation, this inequality here for some real number L greater or equal to one, then it's certainly satisfied for all number L star greater or equal to L. Uh, two metric space MN 
are said to be C by Lipschitz equivalent with respect to some parts of the number L sub C uh, for some element C of, uh, in M. If there exists a non-negative real number delta sub C and then my attractive map F sub C from M to N, that's satisfying this double inequality for all X in the uh, closed ball center at uh, C, at radius delta sub C for all Y not equal to C. And such a map is called a C by Lipschitz equivalent. Uh, sorry, the map F sub C is called a local C by Lipschitz equivalent from M to N. So if F satisfying uh, one, then F satisfying two for every C in M. And if there's a local C by Lipschitz equivalent from M to N for all every C in M. If F satisfying zero two, uh, for every real, uh, for every uh, for some real L sub C bigger than one, then it certainly satisfies two for all the L sub C bigger than or equal to L. So now let M and N be two metric spaces, and let F be a bijective map from uh, M to N. Then the local global principle for by Lipschitz equivalences uh, can be stated as follows. F is a global by Lipschitz equivalent from M to N with respect to some real some constant L. If and only if F is a local C by Lipschitz equivalent from M to N for, uh, with respect to some L sub C for each C in M. Since F satisfying 0, 1 implies that F satisfies 0, 2 for every C in M. So to prove uh, the local global principle uh, for by Lipschitz equivalences is just basically to prove that if F is local at every point, then it is global. And if F, since F satisfying 0, 1 again implies F inverse satisfies 0, 2, for every C in N, then again, to prove the local global principle, uh, we just prove that if F inverse is local for every C in N, then it's global. So let's start with some general uh, definition that, that allows us to define a net. So let G be a group with identity E and let phi be a symmetric subset of G containing E. Then we say that uh, phi is a generating set for G if every element little g in g can be written as a finite product of elements of phi, such a finite product is called a presentation for g. A word of length n with respect to phi is basically a finite product uh, from g1 to gn. And the length of uh, any element g in g that's not the identity is basically the least value of all the length of the presentation of g. And the identity element we define to be a uh, length one with respect to phi. So the matrix defined by uh, the length of x, y inverse for any x, y in G is called a word, word matrix with respect to phi. And then G and uh, sub phi form the corresponding matrix space. And for any x in G, the length of x, basically the distance from x to the identity. For any non-negative integer r, an r net in a metric space, G m sub phi is a subset n sub r of G with the property that for each G in G, there is some element in the net within r distant from G. So if you have two uh, space, two metric spaces, which are groups with word metrics M, M sub one and M sub two, then they are said to be quasi isometric. If there exists a non-negative integer R and R nets, N sub one and N sub two in these two spaces respectively, there are by Lipschitz equivalent with respect to some real constant L. G1 and G2 are certainly unique zero net in the, in the respective space spaces. And then you take the union of all closed balls uh, with center radius R, center uh, ranges in the R net, you get the whole group, the whole space. And uh, if you have and G1, G2 are by Lipschitz equivalent imply that they are by, by they are quasi isometrics, which means if they are not quasi isometric, they are not by Lipschitz equivalent. And quasi-isometric invariant of a geometric realization of a group is also invariant of the group. Uh, and thus geometric tool can be used to study group theory. So some uh, uh, commonly known uh, fact about um, daily graph uh, associated to finite set of generator. So let's start with uh, this group Z here of uh, integer and addition. And let A and D, A, D sub A and D sub B be the word metric associated to this generating set. And these are corresponding Cayley graphs. Uh, if A and B are finite, then C sub A and C sub B is, are locally finite. And then the following fact is basically well known in the Gromov geometry group theory is that these two groups are quasi isom uh, these two spaces are quasi isometric via the identity map. You can find the argument in here. 
In fact, most of these terminology in geometric group theory you can find in the a book, the book um, in geometric group theory by Drew Zhu and Kalpovich. C A and C B uh, have the same number of metric ends and are either both Gromov hyperbolic or neither are. And these two ha have the same Gromov uh, asymptotic dimension. So these are well-known facts. If A and B are finite, then these are commonly known facts in geometric proof theory. So let's set up before we start our problem, let uh, set uh, give a setup for it. So let A and B be two positive integers greater than one and D sub A of A and D sub A of B be the word, word metrics of the additive group uh, Z which uh, associated to this infinite generating set of this form or the negative power of B and A uh, with plus and minus. And let's see sub A, uh, A of A and C sub uh, A of B be the Cayley graph associated. And uh, basically these are the graph where all the, their vertices come from Z and each of the edge from Z basically a pair of elements Z and Z where N come from the generating set. Let A1 and A2 denote any two general infinite symmetric generating set containing zero of the additive group of integers. And let C A sub one, C A sub two, again, similarly be the Cayley graph associated to these uh, genera set of generators. So the first problem, this, these are the problem related to A, sub A, A of A and A of B. So the first problem is posed by, uh, posed by Richard Short uh, for the case A equal to two and B equal to three. Um, the question is whether these two spaces are quasi isometric. For this problem, John Conway suggested a, in a, at a number theory seminar at Princeton around 2008 to compute the function lambda two comma three H. Uh, this function basically gives the smallest positive integer that can be written exactly as exactly H, some are different of power of two and three, but no fewer. Well, my, our approach uh, from, uh, from an unrelated direction, but this function itself leads to interesting open problem, uh, especially concerning its growth. So the second problem is uh, uh, posed by Nathanson, for, again, for the case A equal to two and B equal to three, are the arithmetic spaces, these spaces, are they by Lipschitz equivalent? And the next one is basically a generalization of these. So they ask for the, ne uh, the necessary and sufficient conditions for these spaces to be by Lipschitz equivalent or quasi-isometric. And the last problem is proposed by me. The number four is that there's a local global principle hold for these maps between these spaces. Problem five through eight. Uh, concerned the, the, the more general version A sub one and A sub two, where they just uh, symmetric set of generators containing zero. So what are, the, what are the necessary and sufficient condition for these spaces to be by Lipschitz equivalent? What are the necessary and sufficient condition for these spaces to be quasi isometric? Classify the minimal nets the minimal net in these, uh, in these spaces and determine their relations if these spaces are by either by Lipschitz equivalent or quasi-isometric. And what are the necessary and sufficient condition for the local global principle to hold between these spaces for by Lipschitz equivalence and quasi-isometric between these spaces? So um, these are the facts I already known about the set uh, A of A and in the associated Cayley graph is that these two spaces are quasi-isometric via the identity map if some power of A is equal to some power of B. And this is the result of Nathanson. It's also it arise from the, the, the suggestion of uh, uh, John Conway uh, that I just mentioned a little while ago. C of A of A has one metric N for each integer A greater than one. C A of A is not Gromov hyperbolic for each integer A greater than one. And they, they, uh, it also does not have U property A, which is a weaker form of amenity for each A greater than one. And uh, C A of A has infinite Gromov asymptotic dimension for each A greater than one. So basically they have, and all these properties are known, are well known to be quasi isometric invariants. So they have, all, all of these properties are the same. 
which lead to the next, uh, and uh, also this is a, they also are uh, large scale path connected, all of them. So it lead to the limitation of a quasi isometric uh, invariant as tool to resolve these problem. So previous attempt to solve this problem by using quasi isometric invariant is tool to en encounter their limitations. So a typical way in showing two spaces are not quasi isometric, isometric is to look for known quasi isometric invariants which distinguish them. From before, they're all the well-known one, they're all similar, they're, they're all the same. So therefore this uh, technique doesn't lead to solution. So our main result, results are the following. The complete solution to problem one to four, the complete solution to problem eight to, uh, five through eight. Uh, the solution for problem one through four alone is uh, uh, roughly around 260 to the 70 pages long. So therefore, um, and it's, uh, right now it's, uh, they are under, um, review, under review by various by journals. And because it's, uh, it's uh, the length of it, it's not practical to go through the proof of these, uh, these, the solution. So therefore I will go uh, to a different route uh, uh, Instead of going through the proof, I will go through, I will boil down to a few, two or three core ideas that make the solution possible. And then I, I will show the statement of the results and the current status for them. These solutions are recently obtained, currently in preparation. So in our method for solving problem one through four, the following are new ideas and tools. I boil down to two or three uh, items. We introduce the concept of simple elements and the idea of analyzing the associated structure and connection between these structures under various maps satisfying certain local and global properties between any two of these spaces, rather than analyzing the direct connection between individual elements of these spaces and their images under possible Lipschitz equivalence and by Lipschitz equivalence and quasi isometry. And we introduce the local global principle for these maps in this context and use the, the local global compatibility for these maps as tool. In our method for problem five through eight, our solution for five through eight, we, uh, the following are new ideas and tool. We introduce the concept of effectively simple elements and elements that are called simple similitudes and their respective heights and utilize these heights is tool to provide the essential structure for, uh, for the general cases, which make it possible for classifications. And we also introduce the concept of double-based balls and utilize the, them as tool to as a crucial tool to connect and generalize the result from problem one through four to the general cases in problem five through eight. The result below resolve problem one and two completely. That this one is a problem. Uh, posed by Richard Short, and this one is uh, the one posed by Nathanson. So basically, it, A equal to two and AB equal to three. And these spaces are not quasi isometric and therefore not by Lipschitz equivalent. The following result will, will uh, the following result will resolve problem four, uh, the local global principle problem, for the case A equals two and B equal to three. Basically for these two spaces, the local global principle doesn't hold. And then we, uh, sorry, before we get to that, the, stat, the, the paper that contained these theorem uh, is currently under uh, review by the Annals of Mathematics since the beginning of last year. So it, uh, and it's around 84 pages long. So it, uh, I expect it to be take a while for it to be vetted. And then, and then I, I push further to instead of two and three, I put to them two consecutive integer A and B. Then the, I show that these two spaces are also not quasi isometric. And I also solve the local global principle one, and they are the, it's also fail for, the, for these two consecutive integer greater than one. And this, uh, the paper that contained these two theorems is the main uh, theorems. Uh, roughly around 60 something page long and it's under review by Invention, Invention of Math uh, since uh, last June, uh, June, of, uh, June of 2020. 
And then I push further to the pair of integer of opposite parity. And then uh, again, this, these spaces are not quasi isometric. And then the, the local global principle also fail for them. And the paper that contain these uh, two theorem at the main result is uh, under review by uh, the Annals of Mathematics since uh, last August. And then uh, this, this last two theorem are basically resolve this problem completely that for any two integer a and b greater than one, uh, the, they are the necessary and sufficient condition for them to be quasi isometric that they are of the same parity. Sorry. And uh, the local, local global principle fails in this case as well, for any two integer greater than one. A distinct integer. For problem five through eight, and the, that paper is also under review by the annual since uh, last uh, October. I submitted last October. Um, so theorem nine is basically the, the first result for the uh, solution for problem five to eight. So this, basically this one resolved problem five and seven. So since this is more general uh, set of, ge of, a, of a generator, so the result is nice to state more technical. So let me start with uh, that A in one and A2 with two infinite symmetric generating sets of integer containing zero. And let these two be the correct, uh, corresponding uh, spaces. Uh, then there are by Lipschitz equivalences between these spaces with respect to some real number L so greater than or equal to one, if and only if for any positive integer real any positive real number lambda one sufficiently large depend on L, there exists a positive real number lambda sub two sufficiently, sufficiently large depending on lambda sub one, a positive real number K sub L comma lambda sub one sufficiently large depending on L and lambda sub one, sufficiently large positive integer row one and row two depending on K sub L uh, gamma sub one such that there is a bijection uh, omega between uh, these, uh, this basically is a minimal cover of the set of essentially simple element, which also serve as a minimal uh, net for that, that collection. And this is basically a um, uh, minimal cover by open balls for the collection of points that are sim uh, simple similitude. And this also serve as a minimal net for those points. So the union of those, uh, those balls on this side, and this is the analog on the other side. So there is exists a bijection between them if either one and, the, and thus both are non-empty. And there is also another bijection mu between the regular, the, the another uh, minimal cover of the regular elements. And this also the min, uh, is a minimal net for those point to its analog on the other side. If either one and therefore the other is uh, non-empty, and all these maps satisfy the following properties. The length of the U satisfies this double inequality, the length of the Z similarly. And the, pro the, the length of the U and the, the U and the lambda satisfy the, this double inequality. The length of the U, uh, UI and the rho and the ZI and the rho also satisfy this double inequality. And you take two uh, element UV from these two, the Cartesian product, these two balls, and then these, take these two points from the, the image under omega of those two balls. Then uh, we are different from S, then it's, it must satisfy this inequality. So then I, uh, sorry, this is, then I uh, generalize that to, I push that further to, uh, the set of necessary, necessary and sufficient condition for quasi-isometric uh, properties. So basically, this theorem is saying that those two, these two spaces uh, will be quasi are quasi-isometric if and only if the condition in theorem nine hold, where all the, the the element in there, where n sub zero, which is the zero net, is replaced by the R nets. So the same theorem hold, but uh, with the zero net replaced, the zero, the zero net basically the whole space and replace the definition with the R net. 
So these are the necessary and sufficient condition for two of these spaces to be uh, quasi-isometric. Then the following problem will uh, resolve the local global principle completely. It's basically, that these uh, let the, these are the spaces defined as before. Then the local global principle hold for by Lipschitz equivalent from a from g m sub a one to g m sub a two. So this is to be z instead of g. Just this is z. Even only if the conditions in theorem nine, the long theorem, hold with this minimal net empty for i equal one and i equal to two. So basically on both sides to be empty. And for uh, quasi-isometric, the local global for quasi-isometries between these two spaces, then the condition is also the same with theorem nine whole, but with these minimal net empty, where this is now, instead of the zero net, now the R net. So the, base, the consequent of our result is basically is our result provide insights from a geometric group theory perspective into the connection among these spaces, which play important roles in uh, various contexts in number theory. And with respect to geometric group theory, our result shed light on the quasi-isometric classes of these spaces, by reducing in particular the study of quasi-isometric invariants of these Kelly graph to those of two and three. And have also provide different ways to achieve these fact. And that, I think, is the end of my talk. Oh, thank you very much, Lens. Very impressive. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any questions for our speaker? Uh, uh, if not, then uh, I thank you again. And we have a 30-minute break. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you.